We're going to talk about uh, Lumina, which is a non-direction system we built at LinkedIn for RUM. Um, my name is Ritesh. I'm a performance engineer at LinkedIn. Um, this is Yang. She's a data science uh, data scientist slash statistician at LinkedIn. Uh, and uh, let's get started. So before we go into the depth of it, I just want to introduce the whole team to you guys. These are the awesome people who worked um, on this system. Um, and if it was at all possible to have nine people on the stage presenting a talk, you know, we would have all nine here. Uh, but you get us instead of uh, them. We, you get a poor substitute. Uh, so this is the outline of the talk. Um, I'll, we'll talk about motivation, why we did this. Uh, we'll go over some philosophical discussion about anomaly detection, um, uh, some guiding principles. Uh, then we go into depth of the Luminol, which uh, includes the architecture of Luminol, includes the uh, algorithm choice we made. Uh, we, we picked an algorithm called SignTest. Um, and uh, Yang will go over that, root cause detection. Uh, then we did some tuning. Obviously, with any algorithm, any anomaly detection algorithm, you'll find that you need to do some tuning. Uh, so we'll go over some tuning, and then in the end, we'll conclude the talk, right? So let's talk about motivation, why we did this work at all. Um, this is a graph of uh, one of the major pages on LinkedIn. It's page load time over the course of one year. Uh, as you can see, it started and ended at around the same uh, page load time, right? Year, so year over uh, year, the trend was exactly the same. And that was surprising to us when we looked at it because uh, 2014, uh, where this graph is from, was a heavy was a year where we focused heavily on optimization for site speed. We did uh, multiple site speed optimization, and you can see these green uh, rectangles show where you know page load time is actually going down because of the things we did. Uh, but somehow these optimization didn't stick, and the reason for that is because you can see this uh, orange uh, rectangles where uh, their latency leaks are creeping up into the site. Uh, the page load time is getting slower and slower during these times. And actually, we did some uh, calculation, and according to us, according to our calculations, if these latency leaks wouldn't have stuck, uh, then we would be actually 40% better year over year if uh, there were no latency leaks, leaks like that. So uh, why, do this, why do these latency leaks happen? Uh, let me give, give a quick primer of how LinkedIn works right now. Uh, when a user accesses LinkedIn.com, the TCP and SSL sessions are terminated at the pop. Pop then talks to our data center to fetch the uh, dynamic content. Uh, dynamic content is pushed to the user. And all the static content, JavaScript, CSS, images, are served from the CDNs. And obviously, there's some third-party content on the site also. Right. So leaks happen because uh, at the data center side, there's constant changes on the site. We have hundreds of services. Um, some services release up to three times a day to production. Uh, there are thousands of experiments running at a given time. So all these changes are happening all the time on the site. And they obviously introduce some leaks. Right? Then on top of it, we have multiple data centers, multiple pops. We use multiple CDNs across, across the globe. Uh, we obviously have third party content. Um, and you know, network problems happen all the time in the internet. So all of those, these are like reasons why leaks happen, right? So this made us uh, start this uh, initiative within LinkedIn called Stop the Frequent Leak, or STFL. Um, although the letter F can mean different things to different people, depending on how angry they are at a given moment. Um, but Stop the Frequent Leak is what the initiative has started, right? And as part of uh, STFL, uh, we decided we'll do a round detection. That's just one part of the project. Uh, there were other things we did for STFL, right? So obviously, why, why do a round detection at all? That was the first question we asked. Um, and you might think about the same thing for you. Like, when you're trying to uh, build a system, why, why do you want to do something like a round detection, right? I have two words for you, big data. Um, and this is serious, because if you look at our site, we have LinkedIn homepage, we have profile page. We have jobs page, we have groups page, and many, many, many more pages, right? And different platforms. You have iOS, you have Android, you have Windows, you have different browsers, right? And on top of it, we want to monitor our site across the globe, not just for US, not just for Europe. Uh, LinkedIn user base is global, so our monitoring has to be global also. So you can clearly imagine that 
basic dashboarding and thresholding does not work anymore. Uh, we have a big data problem here. We have a lot of dashboards, a lot of metrics, and our users expect a lot. Yeah, our users expect our site to be functional, site to be fast, site to be performant, right? So we have this nice big data problem, and anomaly detection is a good solution uh, to do that. So let's start with uh, uh, some philosophical discussion about anomaly detection uh, and some guiding principles that we, we decided to follow. Uh, so one of the main guiding principles we decided is important for us is to avoid this alert black hole problem. Right? Uh, this is a dreaded problem for any, anybody who builds a monitoring system. Uh, and what it means is you start sending alerts to your users and users get annoyed because you're sending too many things. And then they start, uh, they, uh, they create a filter for your alerts, and then they go in a subfolder, and then they never look at it, right? So this is where alert black hole is where all your alerts go to die. And we specifically wanted to avoid that uh, from the very beginning. For, for Luminol, the goal was to have sing every single email uh, be useful to the user, uh, every single email avoid this black hole, people, people actually look at the emails, right? So this is one of the main guiding principles for Luminol. Um, and then the other things we learned while we were building Luminol was, uh, you know, when you're trying to build any anomaly detection system, you'll face a lot of choices. And having a guiding principle behind you makes it very easy for you to make the choices. But what choices we made may not be applicable to you guys, so, so think about these choices, and I'll go over these things. There are multiple choices that you'll have to face when you're building any system like that. Uh, choice number one, what kind of anomalies to detect at all, right? And I'll start with the pop quiz. Please shout out uh, which one of these four graphs, A, B, C, D, does not have an anomaly. Any guesses? B? Anything else? Anybody else? Come on. OK, uh, now that I gave you some uh, thing to think about, uh, it's a trick question. <laughs> the, the, the answer depends actually entirely on you. And that is one of the choices you have to make. Right? Um, you may think that all of these are anomalies, because you care about outliers, which is the first one. You care about variance change, which is the third one. You care about steady increase, uh, which is second and fourth. right? You may not care about any of them. You may care about um, you know, only outliers. You may only care about only steady increase, things like that. right? So it's a choice you have to make. Um, and for LinkedIn, we picked the second and fourth one. We didn't want to detect outliers because, again, outliers, I think, will create a lot of uh, uh, false alerts and you know, create the uh, alert black hole problems. Uh, we specifically wanted to do second and, third, second and fourth, but also even then, even then, even when there is a sustained increase, uh, it has to be sustained enough for a long period of time before we generate an alert. And that's the choice we made. Second choice is uh, what do you optimize your algorithm for? And this is an interesting uh, problem for anybody who is a data scientist or statistician. They'll, they'll know that right away. But for performance engineers like us, it took, us, uh, it took me a while to uh, realize this. Right. So imagine that uh, this square is a space of all the anomalies. Right? Um, and based on the anomaly type you, did, you decided to pick in the first choice, uh, the red circle in between is the two anomalies that you want to detect. Everything outside that red circle is the false anomalies. Um, and your statistician, your data science guys, uh, will pick an algorithm that will uh, try to cover these two anomalies, right? So imagine your algorithm is this circle, right? Uh, what choices do you have? You can always start very aggressively. You can pick algorithm that is very aggressive, or you can tune the algorithm to be very aggressive. Uh, that way, you'll, you'll actually uh, cover all the true anomalies. But what will end up happening is that you'll cover a lot of false anomalies also, and you'll generate a lot of false positives. Right? So you can always start there. You can slowly tighten the uh, circle so that you reduce this, uh, false anomalies. You can slowly become more conservative. And finally, you hope that you know, you'll end up being very close to the true anomaly uh, space, and you'll actually, your algorithm will actually cover the exact true anomaly space. That's one option. The other option is you start very conservatively, and you detect only two anomalies. But obviously, you'll have a lot of uh, false negatives where you don't detect the anomalies. You can, again, slowly uh, expand that algorithm, slowly make it loose, so that you slowly cover the actual two anomaly region. Right? Uh, so that solves the problem, right? 
not so fast, my friends. Uh, because what happens is, in reality, our experience showed that the algorithm is not a nice little circle that you can tune to cover your true anomalies. The algorithm ends up being a square, for example, right? Um, this is just a toy example, obviously. Algorithms are never square or circle. Please don't take my word for it. Uh, so, so what happens is what, what you end up doing is you're trying to search for, hey, how do you how do you fit a square peg in a hole? And apparently there's a YouTube video out there that tells you how to do that. Um, I won't trust that guy because his, his user ID is oh, the over engineer. Um, and he has like two likes and one dislike. So don't, don't try this at home. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's, that's basically the tough problem we have. Um, and now the choice you have is whether you live with um, some um, false negatives where you don't detect the left, left, left one, left one, right one, sorry. The right one, left one. Left one is uh, you live with some false negatives where you don't detect some anomalies. Uh, or you live with some false, false positives where you detect all the anomalies, but you know, some of them will be false. And that's a choice you have. You, cannot, you can never be perfect uh, with the algorithm you have. So for LinkedIn, again, uh, we wanted to avoid the black hole, alert black hole. So we, detected, uh, we, uh, we decided to live with some false negatives. That means we will miss some real anomalies, but we really, really didn't want to generate false positives. We didn't want to generate bad emails for our users to uh, get annoyed with. And think, if you think about it, like it's still better than what we, are, what we were a year back or two years back, because at that time we were not, gener we were not detecting any of these anomalies. So at least still a, uh, still a better place to be in. Finally, what metrics do you do anomaly detection on? There are two choices, I think, in my mind, uh, business metrics and operational metrics. Your business metrics are page views, engagement from the client side metrics. You have your operational metrics, which are server latencies, CPUs, uh, GC, and all these things, right? Um, and obviously, there are different dimensions for these metrics. You get uh, country, client type, user type uh, on the business metrics, but you get services, machines, uh, data centers on the operational metrics. Uh, by the way, uh, we'll tweet the slides in the end, so if you guys are interested in details, uh, feel free to take a look at them after the, slide, after the talk. Uh, this other, other part of uh, picking the metric is uh, how do you get to the root cause? Uh, with the business metrics, obviously, you start from top. You've detected the business problem. The business metric has an issue. Then you go bottom, uh, go towards the bottom, figure out which service has a problem, which machine has a problem, and things like that, right? Uh, for operational metrics, it's bottom up. You have a lot of alerts, and you somehow combine them together to give you a good root cause for an anomaly, right? Uh, and the quality is you'll have less signal, but obviously less noise in business metrics. Uh, for operational metrics, you'll have more signal, but also more noise. Um, you guys know we picked RUM, uh, and we picked RUM because, uh, at least for me, again, alert black hole problem was a big problem. I didn't want, we didn't want to generate a lot of alerts. Um, and I think it's a good trade-off to have a little bit more a tougher problem to get to the root cause, but have a much cleaner anomaly detection solution. Right? So finally, the last choice was, uh, uh, again, to avoid the black hole, how do you make the alerts more actionable? Uh, I think we followed three philosophies. You need to send the alert with the right information to the right people uh, at the right time. And what that means for us is the right information is try to give the user as much as root cause as possible. Right? Try to do a great job of finding the root cause. If you can find the right root cause, that's great. But at least if you can point the user in the right direction to root cause, that's, the, that's a good place to be in. To the right people means you know, once you've detected a root cause, Send the alert to the people who can fix the root cause. Don't send it to people who, don't, uh, who cannot fix that root cause. Right? If it's a network issue, send it to your network operations people. Uh, if it's a CDN issue, send it to your CDN operations people, things like that. At the right time means you know, just, just avoid sending too many alerts. Send it, for, for us, we just send out one alert initially and try to avoid sending repeated alerts for the same anomaly. All right, so we talked about philosophy, uh, the guiding principles. Let's jump into uh, the integrity of our system, right? Um, just a quick RUM primer. I think everybody here knows about RUM. It's from Navigation Timing API, at least for the browsers. Uh, and what we get, uh, what we consume uh, for this system is connect time, which is a TCP connect time right there, first byte time, which is response and my response start minus uh, request start, download time, which is response end minus response start, and the client running time, which is anything from that moment on towards the onload time, right? 
Um, so given this four metrics, what we do is, uh, and this is a clear, sorry, this is a quick uh, rundown of the LinkedIn real-time run primer. So we have some real-time metrics, uh, all of the metrics that I showed you before. And the way we get it, you know, client uh, does whatever they do on LinkedIn. We get run data on, from our, one of our endpoints. We send it to Kafka. Uh, and then we consume the Kafka from uh, Samza process, and we send it to our database. And we get all these page load connect time metrics at different dimensions, like different pages, different countries, uh, CDNs, POPs, and, and a lot more dimensions. So here's the main high-level architecture of Luminol. Uh, we have divided it into four different uh, modules, anomaly detection, root cause, alert, and UI. And the reason we did it is because you don't want to send an alert for every anomaly, for example. You may not want to do root cause for every uh, anomaly. And so it makes sense to keep them separate so that you can easily change the algorithms, change the logic. Uh, so I think in our mind, at least it's a different, separate four different sub, sub components. So the way we do it is uh, every 15 minutes, our anomaly detection system wakes up and fetches data from the DB for last few hours, uh, real-time data, and tries to do anomaly detection on all the pages, all the countries, right? And let's say it detected an anomaly, then the data is sent to the root cause module. Uh, it will look at the list of anomalies for this particular moment and try to find the root cause as much as possible. Uh, then we send an alert. We, based on root cause, we, define, we de decide who is the right person to send the alert to, uh, and, and the alert module does that. Uh, and finally, when folks get the email, they can click on the links in the email, get to the UI, debug the problem, give us feedback about whether we detect the anomaly correctly or not, uh, and things like that. Right? And we can use this feedback again to improve algorithm. Uh, so with that, I'll hand over to Yang, who will talk about some uh, interesting algorithms we tried for anomaly detection and the root cause. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more details about anomaly detection and the root cause module in Lumino. So we just wanted to get, kind of give you some intuition why we do it. Of course, there's no stand way to do anomaly detection, uh, like Ritesh mentioned. is actually a lot of choice you need to make uh, to actually make it tailored for your purpose. Uh, so. The purpose of anomaly detection, of course, is trying to find out where the anomaly is. Actually, it is fairly easy to do that if we just do eye check. So when you see the uh, metric plot, it is fairly easy to figure out whether this is an anomaly you care about or not, right? Uh, however, things are not so easy once we have thousands of metrics to monitor, and we cannot do eye check on every one of them. So it's not a good use of our time. So what we want to do here is basically we want to have something automated and to tell us whether this is an anomaly we care about or not. And that's the hard part. Um, so we want to do anomaly detection. So of course, we need to first uh, kind of have an idea what is normal, right? So if I just give you this uh, red kind of solid line here for a particular latency metric, you probably have no idea where the anomaly is. You can just guess. But if I give you kind of a, kind of a baseline to compare against, then we have a better idea. So for latency, uh, we know that it will have a pretty strong daily and weekly pattern because latency is highly related with side traffic changes. So that's what we use as the baseline for Lumino. And then uh, with comparison to the baseline, we can start to see that uh, some of the anomalies, that's the things we care about, some of those that we don't care about. So we care about sustained uh, latency increase, and we don't want to get something like outliers. So in order to do that, we know uh, from, actually from practice, we know that thresholding does not help. Because if people s uh, in industry usually think about using threshold to do an arm detection, that's, uh, that's the easiest way to do it. But we find it is not uh, actually working for our cases. Because if you want to do detection using thresholding, you're gonna get something we don't want to detect here. Because there are a lot of noise over there. And if you set 10% threshold, then you're gonna find some anomaly over there but you're gonna miss the one we care about in the shaded area because it doesn't have maybe 10%, uh, it will not pass the 10% threshold, but it is a sustained anomaly we wanted to know. So uh, that is kind of in, uh, motivation why we didn't choose thresholding, but we picked sign test. That's the thing we use here. Um, let's just look at, go through a simple toy example to see why we make the choice we make. So we have the baseline uh, for our particular metric like uh, uh, page, page load time. And then we have observation like the yellow line here. Do you think this is the anomaly we care about or not? 
So we, we don't care about outline. So because here we only have one point here, so it's not the things we care about. And for the red one, it's a little bit different because we see a sustained kind of um, increase in latency, and that is the case we want to detect. So how can we distinguish these two observation uh, time series here? So we, we know that if we find the observation is consistently higher than the baseline, then that is something we care about. So how can we capture that uh, in a more quantitative way? So we, a simple intuition is just look at how many points uh, for our observation is above the baseline. So for the yellow one, it's about 4 over 10. So it's close to 0.5. And for the yellow one, it's actually 10 over, uh, 8 over 10, which is 0.8. We can see it's much bigger than 0.5. So this is one simple rule we can apply in our cases. So just to see whether this curve will give us something like, uh, if you look at, compare your observation and compare your baseline to see how often your observation is above your baseline. If that is close to 0.5, that means it's random noise. You can just see like they're equal likely. But if it is much higher than 0.5, then you know there is something wrong with it. So we can use it to do the detection. Um, so, and SignTest is exactly uh, doing the thing I just uh, described. Um, what we think, what we do here is use a very simple statistical hypothesis um, idea to test uh, the rules I just mentioned to you. Um, if you have some data background, you know like hypothesis testing is very popular and commonly used in kind of statistic uh, world. And here, scientist is just a very simple one of them, and there are many more statistical tests. So depending on what kind of anomaly you care about, you can ob obviously choose the one you want. Um, there is um, kind of no simple or no one anomaly uh, hypothesis test will fit for all the anomalies. So this is the one we pick because it, choose, it fit for our cases. Um, this, this fit because for latency, we know there is a lot of noise in it. And instead of looking at kind of average difference between baseline and uh, our observations, we usually care about median and other quantiles. So uh, in practice, actually you find out sign test is more kind of robust. So it will work better for testing uh, medium difference. So that's also the reason why we pick it. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about sensitivity here. Uh, when I say sensitivity, actually, uh, to translate into kind of English, it basically tells you how many anomalies you're going to get, right? So you care about whether you, have, you want to have a lot of false failures or uh, false negatives, then we need to be uh, very careful about the sensitivity of your test. So if your test is very sensitive, then you're going to get a lot of uh, anomalies. Uh, if your test is not that sensitive, then you'll get fewer anomalies, but they are kind of, you are more confident. These are the bigger ones you want to capture. So to do that, there are a couple uh, things we need to look at. One is the confidence level of your test. So here, uh, to translate to this toy example, we just tell you here we say if eight point over 10, they, uh, the observation is above baseline, then we say it is an uh, anomaly. So this is, that is some kind of, that is some confidence we set. Or we can make it higher to be 9 point over 10. So we are more confident there, but you will get fewer anomaly with that particular uh, cut over there, right? Uh, for the second one, it is the window size uh, of the kind of the time series you pick. So here we only pick 10 point. If we pick, what if we peer, pick 20 points? So once, once we have more data, actually we are more confident about, about the noise and the signal in the data. So it will also impact how sensitive your algorithm is. So we don't have time to go into the details, but if you want to know, we can talk a little bit later um, after talk about the details here. Um, another important thing is uh, anomaly severity. So when we do tests, the first two is mainly tell you how confident you are uh, basically tell you whether we can denoise uh, from the data or things like that. But one thing we want, we know is also important is the difference between our anomaly and the baseline. Uh, supposedly, if we have anomaly above baseline, which is uh, kind of significant, which is real, but the difference is only maybe uh, two milliseconds, that is something we don't care about in practice. So we wanted to detect some big difference. For example, it's if it is over 100 millisecond difference, then we know there's something wrong and we need to fix it as soon as possible. So that sets priority uh, in our work to figure out which to look at first. So for severity here, 
what we can do is we can set off a bunch of uh, kind of offset and threshold. Basically, instead of compare, just observation is kind of bigger than your baseline. We can look at something uh, more kind of uh, here. You can look at whether your observation is um, bigger than your threshold, uh, bigger than your baseline or for about 10, uh, 100 milliseconds. That's also something you can test. And if your uh, data past that, then you know your anomaly actually is over 100 millisecond difference. And you know this is something you care about. And you can set priority based on that. So that is the idea here. So if you look at a plot, you can see for the uh, black line there, it is testing um, the anomaly difference, which is strictly over 100 millisecond. For the green one, it is uh, the 500 uh, 5 percent lift difference we detect. And for, if you look at the red one, then it's more severe. It is the 200 millisecond anomaly we want to detect. So if you have these three different anomalies, you can set priority. We can first solve the red one because it has higher severity difference. And then we can work according to the priority here. So that's the use of the sensitivity. And that's can, that can tell you uh, what to work on first. Okay, so a single word about what we do in our detection here in Lumino. Basically, what we do is we pick a time window to figure out how many points we want to op kind of uh, do the comparison. And then we do sign test. And then uh, once the anomaly is detected, then we mark the whole uh, window as anomaly. And what we do, the late, uh, last step is trying to merge with the old anomaly because we are doing this in a, a regular basis. So we want to merge those anomalies together. And that's how we get the shaded area here. Uh, and that's how we find the anomaly we care about. OK? So like I said, um, because we care about sustained anomalies, that's why we pick sign test. But if you wanted to detect, maybe you're interested in outliers, maybe you're interested in variance change in your uh, metric plot, so you can choose other, metric, uh, other hypothesis tests here. Uh, so there is no single answer to what uh, test you want to use. time we have. Um, OK, so now I, I can, now I'm going to talk about the root course detection module. So uh, for root course, it's the step after anomaly detection. Once we find out what is anomaly, then the second question is, what's behind the latency increase? right? So we want to find out what is the reason, uh, and then we can resolve it as soon as possible. So in general, actually, root course investigation is a much harder problem than anomaly detection because um, for detections, you have your data, which is a time series. You can just construct a baseline and then try to detect it with either hypothesis test or other machine learning method. Uh, but for root course, you actually need to figure out what is behind it. And um, you can actually use many more data to help you to figure out the signal. So it's much harder. That's because you have more data. It's actually much harder. Um, but for uh, Lumino, actually, we are lucky that we have some domain knowledge about our data. So it can actually guide us uh, to find out what is the root cause uh, behind it. Uh, and that is how uh, we do um, root course in Lumino. Um, so we will have a kind of a two-pass uh, root course um, detection in Lumino system. So um, because we work on the page download time first, so it's a top-down approach. So we first detect anomaly at top. And then for the root course part, we're going to do uh, a bottom uh, detection. We need to figure out what happened uh, in that uh, top-level metric. And that's what we do for the root course detection. For the first pass, uh, we try to break down the page load time to different components, like what ROM has. And if we do detection on each component of them to figure out which part has problem. So if we find there is an anomaly uh, happen in connect time, then we know it is actually some problem related to network. And if it is, uh, we find that there's an anomaly in the first byte time or page download time, then we know it is the server side has problem. Uh, and also, if it happened in client render time, then we know it's a, a client problem. So with 
this particular setup, uh, we can use the same kind of anomaly detection method to detect and to tell us uh, what kind of issue it is. So if we find out uh, it is a network issue, then we can go to the second pass root cause, which tell, uh, try to tell us which pop center actually caused that problem. And if it is a server issue, then we try to find out which service, which API call caused the latency increase. And if it is a client render issue, then we can try to find out whether it's related with JavaScript uh, problem or it's related with CDN. So that is uh, the second pass root course. Uh, for us, we, um, let me touch base on what we do here. Um, so for the network and client, what we use is a dimension analysis. So we know on the top level, overall, uh, we have latency increase. What we do here is we try to break down um, break down the um, metric to sub-dimension. So we have uh, latency for pop, for example, for here we have latency calculated for pop one and pop two, and then we can uh, do anomaly detection for the metric sp specific for pop one and specific for pop two. And then we can do anomaly detection and try to see whether there is anything going on in this two pop. So, so here, for dimension analysis, is just we will use the dimensional data to try to find out what is the problematic pop center to explain uh, the anomaly. So the same thing we can do it for client. Let's get this. Okay. okay. Yeah. So this is the last one. Basically, we are using another correlation analysis trying to find out server side issues. It's a little bit different, but the idea is we're trying to relate uh, the a latency change in, record, uh, in page download time with some uh, downstream node. And then uh, that is how we're trying to use it to find out a problematic API. Um, so because of time, let's actually move forward to talk, uh, let Ritesh talk to, uh, talk to you about our learnings and how we tune Illumino. All right, can you hear me? No? Hello, hello, hello? Yeah. Yes, okay. Cool. Uh, thanks, Yang. So we'll quickly wrap up. I think we have uh, hardly any time left. Um, so we just quickly go over some tunings we did after we built uh, Luminol. Uh, so after we built Luminol, we started to monitor how Luminol is performing itself. Uh, we started to look at how many number of anomalies we generated over a given period of time. So as you can see, like for some example, pages like homepage profile jobs and groups, uh, these are the number of anomalies we generated over a month, I think. Uh, and you can clearly see like we're generating too many anomalies for homepage. We have like 40 anomalies in a month and that's basically one, more than one anomaly per, per day. So clearly something was uh, missing and we could tune the algorithm better. So then we looked at what happened um, and we found that like this example is uh, on the top is the page load time graph. Um, on the bottom is the traffic graph and you can see clearly there's an anomaly. Uh, but there are two anomalies, actually. The dark shaded areas are two different anomalies. And the middle uh, light shaded area is where actually the anomaly goes to normal. You can see um, the page load time actually gets very close to the baseline here, right? So earlier, what we used to do was we'll actually detect this as one anomaly, this is another anomaly, and two, two, send two different emails. But what's, happening, what's actually happening is because of the off-peak time, uh, the traffic is low because of the off-peak period, uh, the latency spikes don't show up as much because the congestion in the network is not that high. Um, so the anomaly goes away. Uh, so we basically had a simple rule that uh, we won't uh, say an anomaly is resolved until after you know, 12 hours or something. Uh, and we'll wait, and maybe you know, once the off-peak time is done, we'll see the anomalies again, and we, we can combine these two anomalies. That's the, that's the first tuning we did with, to merge anomalies. The second tuning is basically you know, obvious. If you have 100 pages, not all of the pages are important. Uh, so for less important pages, we'll have higher confidence interval, 99%. Uh, so that will give us lesser anomalies. But for more important pages, we have a lower confidence interval of 95%, which means we'll get more anomalies. So because we care about the more important pages more, we can, we can live with more anomalies, more alerts for the more important pages, right? And finally, we implemented a user feedback feature in Luminol uh, where users can actually mark that uh, a given anomaly, is, is it a real anomaly for, from your perspective or not? Or maybe you can just say, maybe, yeah, but I don't really care about this, right? Uh, so this signal is very useful for data scientists and the algorithm because user is telling us whether it's a real anomaly, false alarm, or not, right? And this can be fed back to the uh, algorithm to tune its uh, significant, uh, significance and threshold and things like that. 
Uh, so final version of this report was, you know, remember they had number of anomalies, but number of emails sent after this tuning was much lower. For home page, it ended up being only 10. Um, and we also had signal about how many of them were actually false, uh, false positives, right? Um, so let's quickly go over some examples. Uh, here's an example email we send. Uh, we bother our uh, users, which are the page owners. Uh, one of the pages had an anomaly in US uh, at the 50th percentile, and we there was around 10% uh, increase in page load time, and uh, we marked the root cause as a client issue. Uh, so the user would click on the connect uh, on the page and get to Luminol UI. Uh, here, if they hover over the graph, they can see more details about the actual numbers, actual percentage, and uh, you can clearly see there was a big jump in page load time here. And because we know the root cause is client, we actually automatically show the user the client rendering time just below the page load time, so that they can actually uh, correlate with the page load time uh, uh, metric, the client rendering time. And clearly, he, here we could see client rendering time also spiked at around the same time. Uh, and when we, then we go to the root cause, as Yang explained, we do dimensional analysis. Uh, but here we looked at two different CDNs and did a dimensional analysis of these two CDNs. And we actually found that anomaly is true for both the CDNs, right? And what that means is none of our CDNs had an issue. It was something else. And that something else turned out to be third-party content slowness. Um, and we reached out to them, um, asked them, hey, what's up happening? And they told us, yeah, 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 sorry. We didn't notice it. We'll fix it. And they fixed it. Uh, so the good thing about this is that this would have gone unnoticed earlier, but now that we know it, uh, we could actually reach out to people and ask them to fix it. The, the future for us is to actually detect automatically that third-party content was slow. Right now, we were not able to detect that. We were only able to eliminate the possibility that CDN was not a problem. Right? Another quick example, profile page had a 153% jump in China, um, and uh, we marked it as a server issue at the 90th percentile. Uh, turned out, uh, turns out that China had a major packet loss issue, um, and uh, if you look at the graphs, uh, this, is server, this is a page load download time, this is a client running time, this is a page, down, page load time, and you can clearly see Luminal is actually wrong here in terms of the first pass root cause because of this you know, nice if-else statement that we have. Uh, here, what will happen is if you detect any anomaly in the page download time, we'll not even go and check if client running time is an issue, right? So what happened here was even though page download time actually jumped only by 5 to 10%, client running time actually jumped by 150%. We never looked at it automatically. So this is an area for improvement for us. We should be actually trying to look at the shape of the graph, correlate with different metrics, and actually give a better, uh, a better reason. There are a bunch of other examples. I'll not go through it, but hope, basically the point is it has been proved to be useful for LinkedIn for monitoring its performance. Right. All right, let's conclude the talk. Uh, I think one of the few takeaways I want you guys to take uh, uh, home is uh, if you try to build an augmentation system, make sure you understand your use case very well. Do you want to catch outliers? Do you want to catch sustained increase? Think about exactly what problems you want to catch. And then uh, make your choices about uh, algorithm, about tuning algorithm, things like that, right? And it, it will be your choices. Our choices may not apply to you, but if they do, like talk to us offline, we'll give you more information about uh, something else missing that was not in the presentation. And finally, like anomaly detection is such a sexy word. Uh, word. It's, a, it's a buzzword, uh, but it's not a silver bullet. When people think of anomaly detection, they think, hey, this will solve all the world hunger problem. Um, it's not a silver. It's not a silver bullet. Uh, it ha it has a lot of imperfections. So just embrace the imperfection. Learn to live with it. Uh, figure out how to tune it so that it gives you the right thing that you want. Um, and with that, uh, I want to do. Uh, uh, I want to say that uh, we have open sourced our uh, Luminal library. It's at GitHub. Uh, again, you'll have the slides on Twitter later on. And I did cheat a little bit. We didn't open source it right now. We actually open sourced it five months before. Uh, but we are just announcing it right now. <laughs> uh, uh, and with that, uh, thank you.